Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at a distribution called Hoonix right after this. I wanted to do a, a review of Hoonix for some time now, and I keep pushing it back. I don't know why, um, but I've been getting a lot of questions lately about how to install it and how to use it and what does it do and that kind of thing. And how does it compare with some of the other uh, distros that do kind of the same kinds of things as Hoonix. So why don't we jump in and uh, let's find out how it works. So Hoonix is really software that's designed to preserve your privacy and your anonymity while you're using services or connections through the Internet. But it's really meant to be a little bit larger than just protecting your browsing habits. But it also surrounds applications that are also communicating through the Internet, like your email, which was, by the way, never designed to be uh, encrypted or protected in any way. IRC, maybe have, have a messaging app. Maybe you're using, maybe just reading a PDF that has connections to the Internet. So... It's really designed to wrap all of those kinds of activities uh, so that it's not just protecting you while you're browsing. The second premise of Hoonix is it's really designed so that you don't have to you know, install a separate distro to uh, make it work. So if you're on Windows and if you're on Mac OS, if you're on Linux, doesn't matter. You can install Hoonix at, on a VirtualBox uh, VM and you can, you can take advantage of the protection features that it has without having to reboot or give up your operating system or install something new. The third point is really just a reiteration. It, all your network connections are going through the Tor network. It's a lot. So how does this compare with Tails, for example? Well, there, if you want to see a longer list, you can go out to the Hoonix uh, website and they do a breakdown with Tails on, on what they provide and what Tails provides. But in a nutshell, Tails is a throwaway environment. It's merely meant to, you know, you use it and then when you turn it off, it, it all, all your, everything you did, all the logs, all the, all the cache files, any kind of changes that you made to the system are gone. They're just, they, they're, they're just gone. Now you can create an optional persistence layer. So if you're intended on doing some work, like creating documents, or maybe you need to preserve your Wi-Fi settings or your network settings, you can do that. It gives you an opportunity to do that. But it's real, Tails is really just a throwaway environment. Hoonix, uh, however, runs inside of a VM on your computer, so it's persisted to the virtual machine. How does Hoonix differ from the Tor browser, though? Well, as we said, the Tor browser only protects your internet browsing uh, habits. It doesn't do anything for any other applications that you have running. So uh, the other thing is, is that if a virus were to bypass your Tor browser, it would be on your machine, your host machine. Whereas in Hoonix, if it got past the Tor browser, it would just end up inside of a virtual machine that you could destroy and recreate. So Hoonix also includes a number of applications such as a web browser, of course, the IRC client. It also gives you some office applications. It also has IRC and messaging and all those kinds of things. And that all of those come pre-configured with security in mind. And we'll talk a little bit more about how it does that in a little bit here. Okay, so what about using a VPN? Doesn't that protect all my connections to the internet as well? Well, yeah, a little, but not really. Uh, a VPN is really only protecting your uh, privacy between you and the VPN. After that, you're back out on the internet again. So it's really more uh, of a isolation uh, for your ISP so that they are not able to spy on you. But it doesn't really help much beyond once it leaves the VPN. The other problem with VPNs is uh, that you have, usually have to have a, a, a sign-on and so they know your identity. You usually have to pay them some money, right? So you need to sign on in order to keep your account straight. Uh, and they, of course, they have the other end of your keys, your encryption keys, and so they can see everything you're doing. They know where you're coming from and they know where you're going. Uh, VPNs on the plus side, though, are faster than Tor. Tor is limited to 100 megabytes per second. 
and that's just by design, and that's to keep it from, you know, punishing the exit nodes. So, whereas VPNs aren't limited by that fact, although most of them, most of the ones that I've seen, operate somewhere somewhere south of one gig. So, usually around 100 megabits as well. But they are generally faster because the other half of it is that Tor, when it makes its connections through the network, has three different nodes that it goes through, and those can be quite distant in their in their spacing across the globe so it can take time to get it from one node to another before it exits and then out to the site that you wanted to talk to uh, but uh, the other thing is about vpns do you really trust them even though the, some of them now I, I know that some of them are very good and some of them are very you know upstanding uh, and I also know that some of them have claimed <clears throat> not to log what you're doing, but have taken have taken subpoenas to produce logs. And whoo, look right out of thin air, here's the logs on that particular user. So uh, yeah, kind of caught and busted, huh? <clears throat> but anyway, it's whether or not you trust that particular endpoint or not. I'm not saying anything bad about VPNs. I mean, yeah, they do have a purpose. And they do serve a purpose, but you're really, you're really all you're doing is you're just pushing, giving that security off to someone else. But okay, what about if I make up my, if I, if I go on, I don't know, go on to some hosting site and I set up my own VPN? Yeah, you could do that. Uh, setting up a VPN at home would be good if you want to protect your traffic within your network. But if you're outside the network, it doesn't do much good to have it just protect you on your own servers at home. So you'd have to have it on an endpoint somewhere out in the Internet to be the most good. And, and of course, once you put up a VPN on a hosting service, they, they know that you're running a VPN. Uh, and so, and yes, <laughs> same problem. I mean, they, I'm sure that they respect your privacy, but... They get a subpoena. They could potentially, because they're uh, that you are on their servers, they could potentially turn their, your logs over to them. So, and the other question that I've seen a lot is, should you run a VPN with Tor? The short answer is no. <laughs> the long answer is that you already you know you're you're attacking a service that has a login. It has it has a place where it knows your 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 origination IP and your destination IP and they know you're going to tour and so no <laughs> yeah. the short answer is no um, what are some of the features about Hunix that uh, are, are available with it so we already talked about the internet browsing the tour browser but it has uh, instant messaging like Tox and Gajim uh, the Encrypted email is actually using Mozilla Thunderbird. I know what you're thinking. Thunderbird doesn't have encrypted email, but yes, it does. If you install a plugin called Enigmail, that will encrypt, uh, allow you to add encryption to your email. Uh, so, yeah, you can do various, uh, you know, you can use Hunix to do administration of servers and, and wrap that connection up in a, in a uh, layer where, you know, you would not be possible for an att a potential attacker to observe how you're getting access to your public apps, app servers and web servers and be able to monitor what you're doing in order to gain information on how to access and hack into your commercial systems. But it also does full IP DNS protocol leak protection, which is one of the ways your anonymity is put at risk. So a lot of browsers will leak your DNS information, even though you might be trying to protect your DNS or you might be trying to protect your IP, your your outside IP, your public IP. So, yeah, and it also prevents, because of that, also prevents anyone from learning your physical location. So, yeah, there's a lot of different leak protections and fingerprinting protections that we'll talk about as well. I, but it, so it has kind of both. It, it protects you, any, if your browsing habits from leaking any unintentional information that might identify you. And also there are a number of fingerprinting methods today that are used in order to uh, push your data together and form a completer, a better picture of your activities, even though you're trying your best to hide those or try to prevent people from observing them. The other thing is uh, Hunix has App Armor profiles, and those are really designed to restrict certain high-risk applications. So there are certain applications that are, uh, well, they're unintentionally releasing information through the internet, but there are some, Facebook client, so like some that are actually intentionally releasing your information. So uh, 
should you install a Facebook client? No. <laughs> I mean, you're really undoing everything that you're trying to protect. So no, don't don't run known uh, you no know, sites that are that are actively trying to invade your privacy in order to understand all of your habits. You know, it's like having them in your house with you. You know, they're sitting at the table. They're listening to everything you're doing. They're seeing everything you're doing. You know, who your friends are, your relatives, and your associates at work, and your anybody you come in contact with. That's just creepy. I'm sorry, it's just creepy. Um, some of the other minor things is like a whitelisting environment through uh, Corridor. Corridor, what it does is, is like, um, I'll give you an example. If you go to Shodan using the Tor browser, It'll kick you out. It won't even display a page. It'll just give, I think it's a denied access uh, to it. But you can whitelist that connection through Corridor. And Corridor will relax the Tor uh, restrictions to go to sites like that. Basically, that's what it's designed to do. The other layer of, of and so I guess you have to kind of think of Hunix is a de defense in depth, right? So there's lots of different security layers. And that's really the preferred way of doing security, and it has been for as long as I've been around and, and, and around systems in secure areas. So the other one is, the other, the other one is uh, hardening the system. And Hunix provides Kick Secure. Kick Secure is a layer of security hardening features for Debian Buster Linux. And that is the core OS upon which Hunix is, is based. The other thing is that you, and, and there are a number of settings for the hardening that's recommended by the Kernel Self-Protection Project, also known as the KSPP. They have a website. You can go out and see what they're recommending. Those they include in the Kix Secure environment. So they are listening to the standards. They are paying attention to what's going on to try to make their systems as secure as possible. So the other thing that they have, and see, this is, I have, I've said this many times, is that you're in a, a uh, arms race. You have people that want to track you. You have you that wants to prevent them from tracking you. So you do this to prevent them, and then they escalate up and do something to break it, and then up we go. So one of the ways that they do right now is they take your keyboard uh, uh, telemetry, and they build a pattern around how you type, how you spell, the words you use, the types of phraseology that you use, and they compile all that and then they try to match it up with any other activities that you might be doing to identify you as the person since they have no other way of doing it. So Hunix installs an application by default that's called Colac, and Colac um, basically intercepts your keyboard, your keyboard input before it reaches the driver and randomizes and kind of de and it makes it, it is trying to be the anti de anonymization tool for keyboard for the keyboard tracking uh, algorithm. So, yeah, it's like it's like uh, ballistic missile, anti ballistic missile, anti anti ballistic missile. I think you get the idea. That's what's going on here. It's a counter to a counter. So, yeah. <laughs> So enough about the hype, I guess. I, I think the, the very f most important terms that you can, in, or tenets that you can get from this little talk today is, first of all, you know, it, people ask me all the time, is this distribution secure? Is this distribution safe? Well, I can't answer that. I'm not a security researcher. And the only people that can answer that are the ones that are doing security research. Once they take a, a particular distro in, under their wings and they start to analyze it, they may find vulnerabilities and they may publish those vulnerabilities. But one thing you can count on with Hunix, they belong to the group that is, they're going to they're gonna tell you about it. They're not going to hide it. They're going to they're gonna put it up to any kind of vulnerability they have and they're going to say what they're going to do about it. And they're gonna, if they've closed it, they're going to tell you it's closed and when it was closed and what you need to do to get the patch on your system. So they're in a full disclosure mode, just like the other uh, systems. And you know, you have to respect that, right? I mean, that. I mean, sure, it, it's it's a risk to their reputation, but the, the programs that have been around for ten years have found they've found vulnerabilities in them. I mean, they're still finding vulnerabilities in uh, Windows 8 and Windows 7 and XP. 
even though those systems, uh, you know, XP's been what, off the market for quite some time now. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So the other, th the, the th second tenet that you should take away from this is if you sign on to a site and that site is a known tracker, Facebook, uh, you've just undone everything that you just were trying to do to protect your anonymity because at that point it's game over. Uh, you, you might as well shut down, erase your system and start over because they have just, they have just put so many trackers on you. There's nothing really you can do about it. So I guess the thing that we need to do here is let's go get it running. But before we do that, let me get let me just kind of get things set up here. And I'll put this over here. I'll I think I'm going to put myself down in the corner over here. I think I'll be out of the way and then you'll be able to see some of the things. So let's go out to the Hunix site to start with. And it's kind of confusing. I know that the first time I came in here, I was a little bit confused on what to do. I mean, this part is pretty straightforward, but I'm looking, I was looking for a gateway and a workstation and I didn't find that. So I was like, wait, what's going on here? Oh, by the way, Cubes uses Who's, Hunix built in. So if you saw my video on Hunix, you, or excuse me, Cubes, you probably noticed there was a, the anonymity layer that's inside of Cubes is handled by the Hunix gateway and the Hunix workstation. So yeah, those are already in there. And of course that is a environment which is meant to set up according to your use cases for how you browse for your work, how you browse for your personal, how you browse for, for your financial data and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, anyway, you just come here. The first thing you'll notice here is it says you're gonna to have to run VirtualBox and they have a very specific version of VirtualBox right now that they're, they're asking you to support which is 6.1.14. That is not available on Pop! OS or Ubuntu that I could see. Now, Arch, it may be on there already, but it's too new for those other distributions. So my suggestion is just go out to Oracle's VirtualBox site, choose the downloads over here, and there's the 6.1.14, and there's one for Windows, Mac OS, and there's some for different Linux distributions. They have them for Red Hat, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Debian, Fedora, um, and so forth. So, yeah, you should be able to pick it up pretty easily from there. And then you'll, if you have it installed already, of course, you'll have to uninstall it from your distro uh, and then reboot before you start to install this. If you don't, you're gonna mix the libraries together and you don't wanna do that. That's a, It'll catch it, I mean, believe it or not, VirtualBox will catch that, but you don't wanna do that. It'll just create a mess. So you have two choices. You can install Hunix with the XFCE or you can put it out with just a, a, a terminal interface like this. That's not gonna be for us. I mean, that's not that's that's for people that are advanced and so we're not advanced on Hunix, so we're gonna, I'm gonna go here. So I'm gonna download the, uh, the, the OVA file. An OVA file is a virtual machine uh, archive. So it allows you to create an archive of one or more virtual machines, and then you can publish it and share it with others. I was not, I'm not able to do this on Proxmox today because simply for the reason that I, <laughs> Proxmox doesn't support OVA. They kinda do, but you have to kinda go in and rip all the OVA apart and, and pull the disk uh, configuration out and basically recreate the VMs, which that seems like a lot of work for me. I, that's not the way, you know, I'm too lazy to do that. So, we, you know, you just go ahead and download it here. And I've already downloaded, so I'm just gonna go ahead and cancel this. Um, and so, we're all set. Uh, once you've got VirtualBox installed, let me just leave that running. Actually, um, yeah, that's fine. So you can see I already have it installed here, but that's okay. We're going to reinstall it. So to reinstall this, to install it, you go to Import Appliance. The next thing you want to do is go out and, uh, let's see, is it going to, as soon as I, yeah, see it's, this is one of those fun things that I just love about VirtualBox is that it has all these dumb bugs in it. Uh, all right, so there's my OVA file. And now I'm gonna have to go over here and hit open. 
and then I'll hit next and hopefully in a minute here it will come up with this so what I'm gonna do I don't have a user 3 you won't have one I, I don't know maybe you do but I, maybe you won't but I'm gonna put it in home pie I'll put it in its own directory all by itself so it doesn't interfere with that other one okay and then you'll have to agree to uh, to a, a, ter a software license agreement, which is here. And for both, this is one was for the gateway, this is for the workstation. And then hopefully it should start installing. And there's two machines that's gonna create. So this is the first one. I'm just gonna let this run in real time because uh, once I get to, most of the things don't really take that long to, to work. So, okay, so we're installed here. In fact, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and remove those. I don't need them. It just might confuse me later. Oops. Okay, so I would suggest, and you'll, you'll if you were to launch the gateway right now, if you're paying attention to the, to the launch messages, it'll say that you are below the minimum amount of memory and they recommend that you put make the gateway two gigs. So uh, let's go ahead and do that and we'll avoid that little error message. Plus, you know, if it's, it will slow you down if it doesn't, if it doesn't have enough memory to operate now. So I'm just gonna do that, that's all I need to do. And then I'm going to go ahead and start the gateway. You always bring the gateway up first, even after you've gotten it installed and up and running and everything. So, so we'll just wait for it to come up here. Enough RAM available. So, so that's the message that you see there, if you caught that. Okay. Need to agree to some additional under terms and services, I guess one for yeah the setup and we'll say we're done now at this point i can have a couple of choices i can go ahead and connect to the tor network or i can configure it if i want to install a bridge a tor bridge so i don't i'm just going to do a connect a bridge or a proxy actually and so it'll get going here now be patient after it gets this up because uh, it is going to be looking for updates, and so you want to have let it let it run. Just let it have its have its say and let it run through it. Okay, so the, then now we should start to see a, po a couple of pop-ups come up. There's one, and then it'll move it up to the top left-hand corner, and then I'll probably in a few seconds here the next one will come up. This one's looking for operating system updates. Uh, just while we're sitting here, this lock indicates your Tor status and your package status. Uh, that's only true for the gateway. Once you get back to the workstation, you'll find that uh, it's a little different. It won't have the Tor network, of course, because it's going through the gateway to do that. So let me uh, make this a little bit bigger. Now, when you open a terminal window here, pay attention because there's a default user and password. So you might want to change your password. <laughs> you might, you bet you should. I recommend highly that you change your password. Oops, I got lost. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I know. All right, so the other thing is you might want to take a look at the, I, you know, whenever I encounter that, I know there's probably other things in here that are, or probably logging in as like root up there at the top. See, it's got a binge bash. That means there's a login available, that root is able to log in. So you might want to go over and check that one too. I don't see any others. Bin false, that means no login no login same thing so all right so that's the only other one so let's do that
and we'll do a password here too. All right, so now my root password has been changed too. So I'm, I'm just suggesting that you do that. Then over here, you'll notice that this, I re saved this as telling me to run a particular command in order to do the distribution update. So we'll do that. Now I could have stayed in as root, but that's okay. So this is one long command. And then you do distribution upgrade. I don't, I don't think I've ever used that one before until who's who next so so I will be back this this because it's going through the Tor network the length of time isn't installing the updates it's downloading them so I'll be back okay so it's all done I'm gonna go ahead and close up this message up here and uh, I'll I'm also gonna go ahead and close up this window one thing I will tell you the gateway is like a firewall. So you don't want to install your applications on it. You don't want to use it as a, a distribution for Linux. Just just, just keep it updated and, and nothing else. Don't do anything else with it because you're not protected out here. This is really meant to be the, the, the place where it does its initial blocks. Now I'm going to restart this because there was changes to the operating system. So I need to bring those in. And as soon as it's back up, this time it's it's not going to ask me a lot of questions. It's just going to start bringing up the Tor network. So we should be okay to go here on this one. So let's go ahead and bring up the workstation this time. It works identically to the gateway, installs the exact same way. So I'll bring this up. I'll kind of get it started to uh, up to the point where it starts to do its updates just so you can watch how it connects to the gateway. Okay, same kind of thing. We need to we need to sign sign these, agree to them, and then again it does the same type of thing. It checks for updates. That first part went by pretty quick. <laughs> there was also a, a a Tor browser update as well. So the same thing we need to do here. And you'll notice that I have this little connection up here, but you'll, it is different. It just shows that what the status of this updates for the system. So I'm just going to put that up there and then we'll go ahead and get these started, but I have to do all the same things here. So let me just do that real quick. And then we'll do a uh, root. You also have to change. And I'll just stay in root and then run that command when I'm done here. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. I don't need to do the sudo part. And I'll be back. <clears throat> okay, that's all done. I'll go ahead and close up this window and this window. And, oops, one more. <laughs> and then uh, we'll go ahead. We need to restart this one too. Same reason. There was changes to the uh, operating system. So we'll go ahead and restart the workstation.
hang on, I'm going to go find out. This is the first time I've seen it do this. Hang on. Uh, do, do, do. Okay. It finally came up. I don't know what it was doing. <laughs> it was doing something. So now we should be all through all of that stuff. Um, so let's let's just come down and let's take a look and see what actually is on here. So obviously we know we have a terminal emulator, a file manager. We have an email reader and oh, this web browser is actually Tor. Uh, it is the Tor browser and we can bring that up. So yeah, and the, you know there's some information here about there's some documentation if you're interested in learning more about Hunix. Uh, also, I would recommend that you go to the Tor project as well because in there, if you're a first time user with Tor, there's some kind of best practices and pointers and tips that you might want to go through first. It'll just keep you from un unintentionally leaking information that you didn't really want to do. So it'll give you some tips on to, on, uh, as to how to use it and how not to use it. So that's always a good place to go, and then we can we can go do an IP check, and this will go out to the uh, Tor site, and from here you can go there you can uh, you can go and look at uh, the go ahead and branch into here into the Tor website. I'll show you where it is. I'll show you where the documentation is. It's right here. You'll notice that it is not as snappy as, as a normal <laughs> as a normal session might be. But yeah, you know, it, it'll go through if you're using this. You know, how, if you want to know how to install it, if you want to, here's some expert guides. Here's the wiki. Here's some abuse facts and F FAQs and so forth. So, it, yeah, it's a it's a good set of information about what's going on. So, uh, yeah, it's not a bad place to start. And of course, then there are documentation that on the Hunix site as well. Uh, that will go through a lot of different things, you know, about if you if your first steps, the privacy threats, and a basic security, and then if you're interested in a more advanced, uh, some things you need to do in order to keep your system sanitized and that kind of thing. So yeah, security, like I said, it's a, a process. <laughs> it's not do it once and you're set once and be done. This right here on Tor allows you to set your security levels. So this may look like a Firefox security level. It isn't. <laughs> this is a little bit different. Uh, it does, uh, Firefox obviously is the basis for underneath of this, underneath the Tor browser. But so the default is all, everything is open and enabled uh, features. So JavaScript will run, uh, malware will run. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you can opt to turn on, you know, turn off JavaScript if you're on an HTTPS site because that. That's going to be the bulk of them today because most of them are converted over to HTTPS. Uh, and then there's, you know, symbols are developed, audio and video, HTML5 is, uh, I'm not sure if that's enabled. I guess click to play it, yeah. And then you can turn off all of it, everything. So this is the opposite of this one. This, this turns off everything. So some of the sites that you go to may break if you do this. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, if you're using Tor, I'm gonna leave it about halfway up. So if if uh, if you're using Tor, you may encounter websites that don't allow access. So that's what the corridor tool is for: is to whitelist those, so that uh, the Tor processes don't run. So you can still connect to those sites. So that's what that's for. Anyway, um, that's the browser part. And it, again, it is connecting through the gateway. So the connection to the Tor network is on the gateway. So yeah, uh, let's see. Recently, you all, we won't do it that way. Application finder, bulk rename, we have a privacy assistant, which is, this is nothing more than a GNOME version of a key, uh, key uh, a password manager. And then you have keypass XE, which is also a keyboard, a key, I keep saying key, a password manager. And then, yeah, you got Thunar and XArch Archive. For graphics, you know, it comes with just a minimal set. But you remember, this is Debian. So you have access to a huge library of applications. So you're not restricted to just what they give you. If there's something that you want, go get it. I mean, it, 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 it'll manage it. It'll take care of it. So 
Uh, and then out here on the internet applications, you have uh, HexChat, Qtox, Onion Share. I talked about this before. I think I even showed a demo of it, uh, well, briefly, kind of, where you can share documents with other uh, Onion with other Tor users. And so the way that service works is it it's a lowercase. This, I'm going to use the word Dropbox, but it doesn't mean the service Dropbox. It's a lowercase Dropbox where you drop off files and then you send them a link to go get it. They'll stay out there for a certain number of amount of time, and then pff, it's gone. Once they pick it up, pff, it's gone. So yeah, it only lasts as long as it takes them to transfer the data down. Uh, and then of course you have the Tor browser, which we just did. There's also access to the blog and the features and the forum. Multimedia, you just have a very limited set of stuff here: Pulse Audio, Audio, and X and uh, VLC. And then a Monero wallet. There's some other things. And then over here. Yeah, you can clean up this this kind of generic XFCE environment. So get it the way you like it and the way you want it. And then uh, one thing I will tell you, if you decide to set up a firewall, whether you use UFW or whether you use some other, the Hunix one, if you set those up, uh, let me just show you. I'll have to sign in here. So, so the, you notice that there are already rules in here. Well, where did those come from? Those rules are from Corridor. If you elect to put up a firewall, make sure you go into System D and order the install so that your firewall comes up first. Because otherwise, you may overlay the rules for Corridor and now your whitelist doesn't work anymore. So. Just, just a suggestion there. Uh, let's see, what else we need to look at? Is there anything else after this? Unix check, the download the latest version. Now that should automatically check for a new version of the, uh, the Tor browser. So, And I keep wanting to do this one, Zulu Crypt, that I haven't yet. I'm gonna put that on my list of, of uh, ones to do. This allows you to create, to encrypt files, to create uh, encrypt directories, to create uh, encrypt volumes. So that, and also you can make those volumes visible or invisible uh, in order to store files away that are in, in locked away in an encryption encrypted space within your hard drive. So, yeah, it's not whole drive encryption. It's it's a partial encryption. Let's see, what else do we want to do here? I want to. I'm going to clear the screen, and somebody's going to tell me to use Control L. So before I go any further. Let me show you why I don't use Control L. InfoComp allows me to dump my terminal window. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a, the terminal window. I've heard people say this is a shell. No, it's not a shell. It's a terminal. It's a terminal environment. It's an emulator, and it emulates the Xterm 256 color terminal, which is kind of a generic uh, way of, of having Xterm in color. But you'll notice right here that the clear is not a Control L. It has more to it, and the, the type of terminal that you use, they in the old days, we hooked up terminals to, to Unix and Linux. And so some of that holdover is still inside of the operating system. So when you're doing a control L, you're not doing it right. You should, on, on this particular instance, you should be doing an escape uh, and then a control H, escape, control 2J. So I just go ahead and just do the clear because I won't remember all that. And so I just do the clear and it calls this automatically. So just so you know, don't tell me to do the control L anymore. That's a printer command. So anyway, um, yeah, I got used to that because we used to have terminals uh, with printers attached. And if you did a control L, the only thing that would happen was the printer would slew. And then you look like an idiot in front of all your your uh, your colleagues at work. You could, they could hear your your, your printer repeatedly could scroll, spooling off a of a page of paper. But anyway, uh, let's do. I want my usual stuff, and then we'll go explore a little bit. I'm gonna get Git this time as well. I'll go ahead and get this installed. Now this will take some time <laughs> because again, this is downloading from Tor. Uh, and once once it gets downloaded, it'll roll right through. It'll roll pretty fast, but it's, it's downloading. It takes some time. A lot slower than what I'm used to, of course.
Yeah, Cubes, I'm kind of spoiled by Cubes. Cubes does this all for you, so you know, you just update the, each one of the uh, templates and then it takes care of the rest, so. All right, so good, we're good to go there. Uh, let's, let's see what we got here. So this should be Debbie and Buster, and it is. Uh, it's kernel 419.146, I just, just verify it. Yep, and we'll do, we'll see how much memory we're taking. Now I have been running a few things, so 310 meg, not a lot. Uh, and the gateway is probably around 470. I think the last time I looked, it was around there. But uh, yeah, you may notice that K that K lock uh, K L O A K is running. That is the anti de-anonymizer for your keystrokes. <laughs> this is such a mouthful to say. Say that 12 times. All right. So uh, let's see what we got in NeoFetch. Let's see what kind of secrets it reveals. So I've got 1,050 packages installed, counting the ones I just installed. Now that's packages, and um, yeah, it's showing about 313 megs, so that's not a lot. I mean, just remember, don't compare this with Arch. It doesn't work that way. So um, let's see, what else can we do here? Uh, I wanna do, I wanna go over to Opt. Uh, I should check and see how much space it takes. So it looks to me like 3.7 gig is being consumed on a, now you have 90 gig of space. If you, one of the things that you'll have to learn how to do in a virtual machine is if you need to expand that, there is a process to do that. And so, uh, yeah, the easiest way to, to expand drive space on a virtual machine is just add another drive to it um, and then just start moving your stuff over to there. But anyway, I want to do a git clone Guess what I'm going to do? I want to see if any of these constructs show up in, in Linus's report. I, I doubt that they will because I think their hardening is at the kernel level. And Linus looks more around the application layer and the configuration of the system for hardening. So it'll probably find things like you know, the syscontrol and some of the permissions on, on things like cron and cron tab and the cron at and all that stuff. So let's see what we get. Let's try this. And just for review, the at, most of the systems today usually come up around between 64 and 66. 64 is my low, 66 is about average. So. Linus, if you're not familiar, is a tool that will look and see how much exposure your operating system has and then make suggestions on what you might do to make it say, there goes system D with all of its wide open stuff. So I guess they didn't fix that. Yum, wait a minute, is Yum out here? Really? Or is, or is, or is Linus just confused? We'll have to see if they have yum installed. You can, you can install yum in Debian if you want. So I saw a few suggestions here. So let me just see, is yum here? Yeah, no, it, well, kinda, let's see. Kinda, sorta, it looks like a wrapper. It's not there, but it probably was what confused it. So we get a 68, but if I'm seeing things that are yum, then then we have false positives in here and I'm gonna discount those. Yeah, there's one, the yum utilities for better, yeah, it's not even installed, you yo-yo. All right, so yeah, we had some false positives here. So the, the score is probably actually higher than what it's showing here. So I'm gonna give uh, Hunex the benefit of the doubt. It's just got, other than that, it's just got the usual stuff that I always see. Now, I know that um, Hunex installs some additional uh, additional encryption software, which and especially in the generation of random numbers, random number uh, having, making sure that the distribution is even, it is a statistical distribution, that's important for encryption. So the closer you can get to a, a norm, 
whatever that is. But as soon as you can get to kind of a dis an even distribution of random numbers, the more accurate your encryption will be. So um, some of these things, I don't know if they depend upon it or not, but obviously Linus is still picking up on them, saying that, hey, your PAM modules don't use the number of rounds correctly and you need to do those kinds of things. Other than that, other than the yum, this looks pretty stock to me. Yeah, the, the banner is <laughs> pretty minor. Uh, Sysat, Audit D. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would still probably go ahead and harden this a little bit more, but I don't know how that would interfere with what they're doing. So, but again, it's all about reading up and making sure that what you do doesn't collide with what they do, right? So, um, I mean, as far as the XFCE environment is concerned, tweak it, install what packages you want. I mean, this is a, a, a treat this like a normal uh, Debian distribution at this point. Um, a gameplay would probably suffer a bit <laughs> on this because you are going through the Tor network. So it probably isn't going to make the best gaming platform in the world unless uh, you like to get shot <laughs> within 30 seconds of landing <laughs> in the battlefield. But uh, um, I don't know what else I can tell you about Hunix. Let's go back up and, uh, and talk about some of the final thoughts that I have before we close out tonight. And, uh, and I'll just I'll just give you what my and wrap this up. So one of the things that Tails will warn you about if you install it under a virtual machine is that the virtual machine host has a view of your system. So because Hunix is installing in a virtual machine, unless the Hunix team and I don't know this, I'm leaving this as a question if maybe they, they see this video and they and they can answer that. Do you, is there protections in place that prevent the host machine that's hosting the virtual um, box installation, is there enough uh, provisions put in place to prevent it from being able to have a full view of the system? That's really a question. I don't know what the answer is. Can't find it on the website, so I don't know. If you're really concerned about that, install Cubes. Cubes has a DOM0 installation, and then the VMs are, are built around that DOM0. So and you do not get to install it on a host. It has to be on its own hardware to do it. So, yeah, it's a little bit extreme, but hey, I mean, if you're really concerned about it, just Hunix is there. You'll have all the advantages of Hunix on cubes. It's just that you'll have to learn a little bit extra stuff about cubes and how it does its compartmentalization. So, yeah, cubes is really meant to run in a compartmentalized environment. Now, Hunix has a compartmentalized environment as well. So uh, again, there's a there's a wiki article about that. If you want to set it up, it'll tell you a little bit more information about that. As far as me using cubes, uh, and this is just my opinion for me, this has nothing to do with my recommendation for you. Your needs are different than mine. But I like the compartmentalization of cubes better, and so I will probably stay over there. Uh, and use Hunix that way. Uh, but if you like this and you like the convenience of being able to use it from your own distribution, yeah, great. I mean, it's, that's that's fine. Uh, it's just your what's your UK use case and what's mine. It's what makes the difference. I'm not criticizing using it, uh, uh, who's next at all. Just it's just not for me. Uh, the other problem that I ran into was that you know, like I said, doc, uh, uh, Proxmox doesn't support OVA. <laughs> doesn't support OVA. It sort of does and it sort of doesn't. But there are a number of VMs that do. So uh, don't worry about that too much. So would I feel safe using this? Yeah, I would feel safe using it. I would just prefer to use cubes. Uh, again, because they do full disclosure and Debian does full disclosure, I mean, what more do you want? I mean, what more can you ask for about from an environment? You don't have to worry about finding out something five weeks or five years after it happened uh, and then go, oh, I had this whole I had this vulnerability on my system the whole time. Um so, yeah, one final suggestion is, like I said, go to the Tor uh, documentation pages. If you're new to it, go through them. Understand the first steps and what you need to know as a new user. And the last piece of advice, do not ever sign on to sites that are known trackers. Microsoft, uh, Facebook, and others like that. Uh, make sure that you do not do that because uh, you're undoing everything that Hunix is trying to do for you. And so with that... Um, that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this uh, this uh, review of Hunix and a little and the install. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again on Friday. Bye for now.